Welcome back to another episode of CFB Paint. We got Steve and Corey on the pod today, um, doing a little week zero review, a very brief one, as there wasn't a whole lot to cover. Uh, and then a week one preview uh, might even end up, well, I guess like for this year, this episode, we'll probably just keep it all as one. But um, moving forward this season, you'll get, we'll record them kind of at the same time, but you'll get a week review for the previous week. Um, and that'll be in your feed early in the week for you to consume, and then something later in the week to get you primed for the upcoming week in college football. Uh, but let's jump to week zero. Corey, uh, I guess we could do our rapid round. There's really just the two of us. Yes. As far as the wrapid round goes. Let's do it. Uh, it, it. It's Europe first. What were your takeaways? Well, we're going to do an order of best looking, right? That's what we're going to do it in? So I'm yeah. Up. Okay. You got to be up first. I shaved, so. Um. <laughs> uh, so my reaction to just kind of like across the board, I am stoked to have football back again. I'm stoked to be watching football, even if it's pointless football, which is a lot of this weekend was. There were some surprisingly fun games to watch and entertaining games to watch, which um, I think you can always count on for college football. You should never know which ones it's going to be. But um, the other thing that I'm just ready for is to see who's real and who's not. And that'll come in week one, week two. Like, we'll start to see who's real and who's not. We saw a glimpse of some stuff that may show us where teams are headed. But we, we'll find out next week who's real. Yeah, I, I had kind of a similar similar takeaway from you. I just, man, it is so good to watch games that have meaning. Uh, the NFL preseason just does not do it for me. I don't know if you've ever watched any of it. It's just like, man, it just, I find myself scrolling through my phone way more than I am actually watching the screen when, when the preseason of the NFL is on, just because I know it's like, eh, this wasn't, there's not a whole lot of stakes to this. Yes. Um, but yeah, games that matter. Um, it's it's time to time to play. I love it. A couple of things that I had as, as takeaways is, yeah, like you said, there's there's maybe games that don't a, move the needle on, on the national scale or, or, or when it comes to, you know, championships being handed out. But you saw some competitive teams. How about Jacksonville State winning their first game as an FBS team? I thought that was pretty cool. Welcome, uh, Rich Rod. <laughs> yeah, Rich Rod's back. <laughs> uh, UMass breaking a very long road losing streak was fun. There, there's there's some fun storylines and, and Hawaii making it interesting late against Vandy. You know that they lost that game 63 to nothing last year and were had the ball with two minutes left on the road with a chance to tie or win the game. So uh, maybe Hawaii is making a pretty solid leap in uh, year two under Timmy Chang. I'm really excited for that program, particularly with all of the current events in Hawaii. I think it certainly doesn't hurt for them to have uh, – Something to to you know uh, to rally around and and for some maybe it's it's a welcome distraction from some of the pain and uh, heartache that the the fires in Maui is um, have have caused for people. So um, that being said, like I don't know which games did you want uh, you want to take us through? Did you have any that you uh, wanted to specifically cover? Yeah, I have four that I kind of want to talk about. Um, sure. Mainly Hawaii Vanderbilt, USC versus uh, San Jose State, Notre Dame versus Navy and UMass versus New Mexico. But I don't know how you want to handle that. Do you want to go by games? Yeah, maybe you just pick one and we'll, we'll go through it. Um, so I'm going to go Navy versus Notre Dame. Um, okay, I I think a lot of people walked away from this game going, oh, wow, Notre Dame is the real deal. Like, they, are, they look good. And I can see where they come from on that position because, like, they have a better, much better quarterback. I mean, they're – there are two quarterbacks that were, that were fighting for the position, you know, Drew Pine and uh, the backup quarterback. Now. Tyler Buckner. Yeah. They're both backup quarterbacks somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> Drew Pine's over at Arizona State and Tyler Buckner's at uh, Alabama. So um, they have a good quarterback. Hartman looked good enough. Um, I think people are like, oh, he threw four touchdowns. He, You know, he had really good numbers. Um, let me pull up his numbers real quick. Um, I had him. He right was here. 19 for 24. Yeah, everybody talks about him like. Or 19 for 23. Four touchdowns, four incompletions. Yeah, and I thought he did a good job of kind of running the offense. Um, clearly, this team can run the ball. It's against Navy, much smaller defensive line, but a defensive line that averaged like, what, it was like 80 yards per game rushing last year. 
So we'll see how it goes. But I think this is a team that's going to be multifaceted. You're going to be able to pass the ball and you're going to be able to run the ball. And they have they don't have maybe great weapons on the outside. Last year you had only Michael Meyer, Michael Meyer. Um, but this year you actually have options that you can be successful. Nobody that like is going to razzle dazzle you, but you have the options. And then Estime, their, their running back, however you say his last name, he he looked good. He looked solid, and he looked like he can carry this team. So it looks like you're gonna have that pass and your throw. The one thing I'm gonna say is like, I went watching this game. Notre Dame played solidly and impressively in my in my head, and and all the talking heads seemed to say that like, oh, they, they looked really really good. To me, there was like, Hartman didn't look as well as I expected him to. Like a a lot of balls felt very floated to me. I'm like, oh, that guy was in the position. There's no way he's getting that ball or. If, if these guys knew how to kind of play a little bit better defense, there's no way that's going to be completed. And then, like, a lot of times the balls were, like, behind your receivers or whatever else, and, and they were still caught, but they weren't in the best position. I think if you play a better quality opponent, you're not going to have – not going to look nearly as good. And I'm interested to see when they see they start to go through – I mean, they have a tough schedule. They have Clemson. They have Ohio State. They have UFC. Like, um, like it'll be interesting to see how they really stack up against these teams. But – I didn't. I wasn't overly impressed with that. I think you have enough balance to kind of keep teams honest. They're gonna to have to guard you, but yeah. From a Navy perspective, you tried to pass the ball a little bit. Like your quarterback didn't do a very good job at that. I mean, you went three for six, and to be honest, those three probably were like kind of lucky on the catches. You had probably some of them that should have been caught, but they all look terrible. They're gonna they're gonna to have to rely on that triple option still a little bit more than they probably want to. As they, I think they're probably gonna get go out of it. I mean, I mean, they talk about like they might say something in it, but the offensive coordinator's history is in a spread offense. So I think like you want to kind of move that direction a little bit, but I get the fact that you're undersized and you have to rely on that triple option to be successful. It just it wasn't overly pretty from that perspective. Yeah, like I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying there. Maybe were some throws that maybe weren't exactly where they needed to be my bigger beef was like yeah he completed lots of passes but like how do those passes were there was there actually like really like decent coverage um i i I count one and it was a touchdown pass where he he does drop it in over but even then uh the i think it's the safety who's playing catch up because they do a, a seam route um and that's the one thing where it's like Honestly, I, I trust Sam Hartman. I've seen him throw enough footballs that it's like, okay, he, he can do it. Particularly last year, look at the Clemson game. Um, he he can he can thread the needle. Um, but it'll just be interesting to see how he adjusts to uh, playing in a new offense and then playing against competition that's a little bit more ramped up than uh, than the midshipman more uh, in in game one. So. It, hard to draw too many conclusions. I, I think you're right that for me, the truth is kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, Notre Dame looked buttoned up. They did. Um, it's hard to know, engage in week one. I, I will always go back to the, the Kenny Hill uh, principle <laughs> of like, okay, yeah, he carved up number nine, South Carolina, but South Carolina ended up going, I think, five and seven on the year. So it's like, I, I try not to jump to conclusions, but. Correction, you mean Kenny Trill? Kenny yeah. Trill, yeah. <laughs> And honestly, I, I, I agree. My mind went back to the Clemson game um, with his ability to throw the ball and throw the needle there. I also kind of remember like hit him and Wake Forest, like, they didn't blow teams out. They always kind of played a little bit to their competition. Like they always won their games a lot of times, but they didn't play where they could have probably. And that might be a product of Sam Hartman. Like there wasn't a lot of threat here. So Sam Hartman was kind of like, all right, whatever. I'll take what they got me, give me and not worry about it. And maybe when the game's on, he come, turns that game remote on. We'll see. Yeah. I wasn't able to catch the USC San Jose State game, uh, so I really only saw the scoreboards. Take me through your your thoughts on it. So, if you didn't get a chance to watch the highlights, I'm sh- or if you did get a chance to watch the highlights, I'm sure you saw Caleb d- drop the d- Caleb Williams drop the the snap and throw a 76 yard bomb over the top of everybody. His longest touchdown pass ever to score. I think it was their second touchdown and go 14 seven. Um, my takeaways. Caleb Williams is Caleb Williams. He's good. He's going to be successful. He did not look as mobile as I would have expected him to this like normally. There was times when he got caught on some pretty bad sacks. So I was like, I'm a little surprised on that one. Um, But he's still Caleb Williams. He has, we kind of questioned a little bit of the tools. Brian and I were talking last week, like what tools does he have on him? It seems like there's tools, especially that Zedekat or 
what's his name zachariah zachariah branch yeah yeah okay that kid is fun to watch i i've heard comparisons people talked about like oh that looks like reggie bush out there oh that looks like tyree kill out there to me i'm not always good with comparisons the thing i really liked is just like he put his foot in the ground and he was and made decisions and then he accelerated and he could accelerate faster than anybody else i love the north and south of that kid it's there's cuts and weaves and stuff like that but it's not like i'm juking you outside the side it's like I'm going this way and you're not going to be able to catch me. And I'm going to go this way and you're not going to be able to catch me. And it was impressive. It was fun to watch. That kid is talented. And the fact that he is starting game one and, and the fact that he like was that much of a revelation. I get it's San Jose State, but that, that kickoff return, if you've not watched that kickoff return, watch that. He sets it up for the first two, three yards, kind of goes a little slower and sees where he's going and the acceleration goes on and it clicks. There's no getting up to speed. It, it goes from Gear one, gear five, boom, gone. So that was impressive to me. Um, takeaways from the game, San Jose State's not a scrub team. They they scored a little bit against uh, against them, what, 28 points, I think. Um, but a lot of their scores were, like, tightly contested throws that were, like, pretty good plays by the receivers, in my opinion, um, which, is, which surprised me a little bit because – a lot of other times, there, there was like uh, the one touchdown at the end of the end of the half. That that wide receiver was a little bit wide open, but like the back defensive backs for for USC, I think there were six or seven calls of holding or pass interference because they were struggling to keep up with these receivers. Now I get that they only scored that they scored kind of more in tight situations, but there was like multiple multiple times where they were holding or keeping and driving line because they were uh, pass interference, and the second like. Cordero is a pretty mobile quarterback. Um, the second he broke in tame of those front seven, they were screwed. He was, he was, he looked like he was going to cause a lot of problems. And that's one of my takeaways for, for USC's defense are okay. If you face a team with decent quarterback, like semi mobile quarterback and decent receivers, you're going to still be in trouble. This, this defense looks similar to the defense of last year. I didn't see overall a ton of improvement. Um, I'm, I'm a little nervous saying that because I think you should see improvement and I think you can see improvement, but like, it, it looks like they're going to have to win shootouts. San Jose State is a, is a good group five team. They're not a good power five team and they shouldn't be being that relatively close to that team. I get you score 56 points. If you score 56 points, you're probably going to win most games. But if you get a deep, you face a defense that is able to stop you a few times and you face a mobile quarterback, I'm looking at Washington. I'm looking at Oregon's. I'm looking at Utah. Like you have some of those people on your on your schedule. I was gonna say I, I think I think there's a few of them that meet that description exactly. Play yeah. plays decent defense and and have a a semi mobile quarterback. So yeah, yeah. even Washington State. Yeah, like there's <laughs> there's quite a few that I don't know if they play all those teams, but like there's quite a few in the Pac-12 that can give us some issues. I find it very hard to believe that USC becomes comes out on skate, um, just based off of what I've seen, but. It is Lincoln Riley, so he finds a way to win. He finds a way to get himself to the playoff, or should in the playoff picture, and then lose it at the beginning. So we'll see who happens. All right, all right. Uh, next game, uh, we'll be quick here. I I don't know if there's a, a ton to take away other than, um, yeah, Massachusetts breaking. I mentioned it breaking a, a big time losing streak on the road goes and and wins to open the season. I don't know how long it's been since we could say that UMass was undefeated on the season, uh, e- even into week one. I think it's probably at least been three or four years. Yeah, so good for them. <laughs> Maybe I'm trying to try to make sure I'm not saying anything wrong. Uh, but yeah, Tyson Fomacon ends up leading the leading the team in rushing, 96 yards, touchdown. Uh, didn't work out for McClemson. Didn't work out for Georgia Tech. Maybe he's found his right level. Uh, that's just fun to see. And Don Brown, the head coach there, longtime defense coordinator at Boston College and at Michigan. Uh, I'm a big Don Brown fan, so I just wanted to like give them a little bit of love. It's cool to see them start out undefeated. Um, I don't know how long that will continue. Uh, just taking a quick glance at their schedule. Uh, <laughs> they play at Auburn next week. So, yeah, Easy, savor man. it. Savor it, mini, Minutemen. It's, uh, <laughs> this is, this is uh, a high water mark. Um, are there any other? Oh yeah, if, jump in. If you did not watch that game, just go turn on the fourth quarter. The game started then. It was thirteen to ten <laughs> before the game started, or before the fourth quarter started. 
the final score ends up being 41-30. Both teams kind of like started to play for it, and UMass pulls away for a little bit. I think they get up 34-17, and then kind of there's a little bit of scoring towards the end. But, I mean, some back and forth, some teams making some plays. UMass has, if you guys read ESPN at all, there's an article that I love on ESPN that comes out weekly. It's like the bottom 10. Um, UMass is always in the top, bottom 10, you know, one, two, three. This year, they're going to escape that. They look like they have the talent to be a three, four win team. Uh, like, and it's kind of going to be exciting to see how they do. Like who's going to replace them as the bottom dwellers, you know? Yeah. They did have some notable transfers. I don't know if you saw that graphic in yeah. that game. Um, several of those guys uh, had some recruiting pedigree. Um, maybe it didn't shake out for them in their first or second stops for some of them. Mark Pope is the one that I'm specifically calling out for two stops. I, there may have a couple of, of, of multi transfers, but um, you know, he played at Miami. Uh, didn't shake out there, and then he played. I can't remember where else to go. Jackson State, I think. Um, but it has ability, um, so it's, it's it'll be fun to see what what UMass can do moving forward. Um, last game that we wanted to to touch on before we get into our week one preview, uh, Hawaii at Vanderbilt. Um, I don't know if you wanted to to break down this game. For me, this was one that was just interesting. Basically, from from the word go, you saw. I I think fun things to take away from both teams. I mentioned before um, the improvement from the, the the Rainbow Warriors year over year is, in my opinion, and it's early, but is for real. Again, they got blown, they got their doors blown in last year at home against Vanderbilt and gave them a game. Again, there was times in this game where it looked like Vanderbilt was going to coast to a victory, but, um, you know, that wasn't credit them. They kept fighting. And and had a chance down uh, down the stretch to maybe either force overtime or even steal the game on the road. Um, end up throwing a pick that kind of seals it for them. And uh, you know, tip your cap to the to the Vanderbilt Commodores. They're they're starting off one and zero, but um, I think both of these teams look much improved from last year. Um, and so I'm I'm excited to see what they can do in their respective kind of quests for bowl. For a bowl, I don't think Hawaii is going bowling, frankly. But you you play with that kind of effort uh, against the rest of your schedule, and and you're going to have a puncher's chance. Yeah. So, on that? Yeah. No, sorry about that. Um. So I'm going to disagree with you on that. I do think Hawaii goes bowling this year. I'm all for it. I um, love it. So like yeah, the running shoot uh, Hawaii's offense from the past is kind of starting to rear its head again. Uh, underneath their their coach, uh, he used to run at Tommy Chang or Timmy Chang. Um, they kind of started to get the grasp of it. It looked like a little bit last year towards the end of the year. They ended up, I think, with three wins last year. And this year is still like, all right, we're starting to get full effect of it. And honestly, to me, like, Hawaii more lost this game than Vanderbilt won this game. I was not impressed with A.J. Swan's decision-making. I was not impressed with A.J. Swan's throwing abilities. Um, to be frank, like, there were times where he, like, Basically, what I think is is Vanderbilt capitalized on their opportunities, and Hawaii didn't. They went there. There were two times they went into the red zone without scoring. Uh, they threw an interception. Um, I don't know if you watched that play. Basically, they have a run. They have a they they run a screen pass down to the one. One of their players fumbles it, and they think they recover it in the end zone. They think it's a touchdown. Um, it's not a touchdown. It's called off the board, and they recover it at the one yard line. Then they throw a pick and. The guy makes a pretty good uh, interception, but he lands his like his, he he goes up for it in the corner and land, lands his like just left foot in, barely. It's a great play for for Vanderbilt, but really not a great wise throw from from uh, Braden. I don't know how you say his name, Shager, whatever. I, I watched the game but on the broadcast. Yeah, I think yeah, that was how they're pronouncing it. If you're familiar with our podcast, you can remember. I don't remember any names. I just remember players and what they do. <laughs> if that's it. Um, but no, it was not a great decision. And then another time down the red zone, fourth down, they miss a pass in the end zone that they should have probably checked underneath and got, getting the, giving themselves an opportunity. I think it was like fourth and six, fourth and seven, or you come away with three points. Both opportunities are not ideal. And you also throw the interception at the end of the game. There are, is twice in this game where, where AJ Swan literally puts it in defensive backs hands with nobody in there in front of them. There, there's throws that are out in the flats that he's made pre-read, pre 
and he hits cornerbacks from Hawaii in the hands, and neither one of them can capitalize on that. So the two interceptions, the two missed red zone opportunities, and the two missed pick opportunities are the big difference here. I mean, you out pass this team 351, and if you watch that second half, they just start throwing deep bombs because they get over the top of Vanderbilt over and over and over again, and Vanderbilt can't hold, hang with them for a little while. And they finally clue on, and that's when the game starts to get tight again. And then the fact that neither team was able to rush. That, this Hawaii defense front seven looked pretty impressive to me. I mean, they – I thought so too, yeah. Yeah, they held Vanderbilt to, what, 39 rushing yards or something like that? And I think there was three sacks in the game and nine and a half tackles for loss. I looked at the numbers at one point in time. That's what I think they are off the top of my head. Um, but it was it was a fun game to watch and and a fun game to see. And the other only other thing that I feel like hurt Hawaii is is they dropped like flies during that game because of humidity and cramps. If you drank some pickle juice before that game or whatever you needed to do to make sure guys are hydrated, I know it was humid. There's humidity. Like they could have won that game. They could have had a win over the SEC for the first time ever. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it it was an opportunity lost for sure. Um, again, I, I think they had to kind of come back, but they, they did make it interesting. The big thing for me um, was that there were several times they had the opportunity to get off the field on third and long, and they couldn't get that done. Um, and so uh, sometimes that's the name of the game. If you, you win first and second down, but you give up you know, nine plus on third down, uh, it can erase a lot of that good work. So... We know what that's um, no. what the being floor state brings, you know. <laughs> Oof, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that that's one of those things that they, um, you know, can can take away maybe some confidence from this that they, they were able to hang uh, with an SEC opponent, um, and they've got more opportunities. In fact, they're only a three point dog to Stanford right now, so um, they've got a, a chance to turn it around and. It's not quite the same travel week <laughs> coming up in week one that it was in uh, going from Hawaii to Nashville, just just going to Palo Alto, just going to the West Coast. So, um, yeah, it's, it's with at that, home. it's at home. Oh, are they hosting them? Excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, so, good. I was gonna say that's. Better. Yeah, that is. Um, all right, go go go, Bows. Um, I, I'm all for it. Um, speaking of week one, um. I don't know where you wanted to take us. There's a lot of meat on the bone, some conference games, not not a ton, but some interesting ones that will kind of start to set the pecking order in specific divisions. Uh, there are some fun interconference or like interconference matchups. Uh, may, maybe we start with a Thursday game. I feel like that probably makes the most sense. In fact, there's there's two Thursday games that I might take just a second on. Um, maybe the first one we talk about. Uh, the Minnesota and Nebraska game, just I figure this will probably be quick, but to me, that's an exciting game because I don't know who Nebraska is, <laughs> like not yet, at least. Um, and Minnesota is going uh, now moving forward after Tanner Morgan and Mo Ibrahim man the sidelines there for years and years. Uh, feel, felt like they were, you know, NFL veterans, uh, not necessarily in terms of like, quality of play looking more at Tanner Morgan than Mo Ibrahim on that but just they were there for so long um so that one to me is interesting just because it's it's a start of a new era in terms of coach for Nebraska but with Minnesota there's a lot of turnover and change that's expected to take place uh and, and I don't know any thoughts on that game I know I, I didn't tell you we were going to talk about this one but so I'm springing it on no, you no I'm not, I'm not offended uh, I, I've kind of made it known that I'm not a huge believer in that rule. I, I like he's done yeah. adequate, but he's also been at a credit team, so he's like done okay. We'll see. I, I don't. I expect Minnesota to win this game. All right. Like I expect Minnesota to win this game. The line seven and a half. I would take Minnesota to win that o with the over. Or sorry, I take Minnesota over that spread. Um. I get it. It's at Minnesota, so it's at home, so it's a little bit better for them. I get that they've had some turnover, but I, I don't know. I just the one thing that you can count on that rule team is for them to be like accountable and be in their spots and, and be in the positions. And so, like, we'll see where this goes. But I jury's out. I mean, Scott Frost can do it in Nebraska, and I thought Scott Frost was a great hire for that. We'll see. So did I. Uh... Yeah, I think this is fun. I what I go back to is I love that Minnesota often it feels like, and this is for a 
person that does not follow the Golden Gophers program very closely, so I could be way off. But it feels like they play like early in week one fairly consistently. Um, that Thursday night game, you know, they, they hosted Ohio State in C.J. Stroud's first game as a starter a few years back. Um, I feel like they're, they're, it's not uncommon for them to kind of get that early game, and the crowd is way into it. Um, and, and I love, I mean, that's, that's a, a home crowd environment that at least early in the season before like the, the losses start to pile up. Two losses pile on. <laughs> yeah. But, but ahead of like them, like kind of saying like, okay, maybe we're not quite in the division race for the big 10 West. Like it's a more intimidating environment than, than it's really given credit for. I think that's a pretty ruckus place. So uh, it'll be fun to see how Nebraska handles, uh, handles that on the road in the first game of the Matt rule era um jeff sims i'm excited to see him unlocked in an offense that will probably better suit him um so that one will be a fun one and we'll get a kind of an early uh an early data point on the big 10 west race and and who maybe is uh maybe takes a, a like inches out into a lead there uh again there's there's plenty of football to be played after that so i don't think either one if they lose is out um but it'll just be fun to kind of see that pecking order uh, start to sort itself out. But uh, next one that I wanted to take some time and talk about is uh, the Florida Utah game. Hopefully, you're. <laughs> uh, Hopefully that's... That, that, that's exactly what I'm like. Where is he going to go next? Oh, yeah. Where would you want to go? Of course, both of us want to go to the Florida the Utah game. You know, literally, we wanted to go, but then tickets are like four or five hundred bucks. We're like, I don't know if it's worth it for teams that we aren't like mega fans of. Someone to, in my neighborhood is that. selling tickets for thirty dollars. She's like, I can't do it. I just want thirty what? bucks. And I was like, like raise my hand. And she's like, sorry, so lovely. Like, Dang it. Oh. We would have had anyway. to be so good. Um, oh, that would have been sweet. Vivin, they've been dropping lately, so maybe we might sneak over there anyway. We'll see what really? Happens. Um, the closest I think I've seen them down to 120 or so. So. Whoa. Yeah. Interesting. Vivid, hmm. yeah. Vivid, uh, where you can get your tickets. You know, not no in no way affiliated with us. This is not in no way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is <laughs> isn't not, an endorsement. Uh, uh, I'm excited about this game. I have been following some Florida podcasts um, about this, and then hearing the chatter up here. The four podcast seem to think that like Cam Risen isn't going to be in this game. You and I kind of talked about this. I think Cam like they like kind of like oh it might happen it might not and, and I think I'm under the assumption he's probably going to play. But yeah, if, if I'm a betting man, I think he suits up and plays. I yeah, think he gives that, it a go. Based off the chatter being out here in Utah, that's what I kind of what I've got heard from people, and also the fact that people are saying he's moving okay, he's like whatever else. But the Florida podcast is like, oh, we'll see how this is. I mean, you don't even have your starting quarterback potentially. Blah, 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 blah. These seem these teams. These two teams seem to chirp at each other quite a bit, which is kind of interesting. And I think Florida's taking for well, never having played. I know, except for last year. And yeah, and I think Florida's taking exception to the fact that Utah's chirping a little bit because they beat them last year and they shouldn't have beat them. I think this is going to be a good game. I think the biggest issue is coming up to the elevation for for Florida, but in reality, like it's not hot outside right now. It's not going to be a bad time. You might have to deal with a little bit of elevation issues where you got to suck some oxygen, but in this day and age, you can suck some oxygen and you get, go out and do the do the next play. I feel like Graham Mertz is the perfect person to kind of unlock this Florida team because he's going to be a lot more consistent in the mid to low to short range than Anthony Richardson was. But that being said, I'm definitely rooting for Utah in this game. I want to see Utah win this game and, and annihilate them. Um, and I'd love to see Florida start, start off 0-1. I yeah, like like I said, I, I expect Rising to play again. That's no, I don't, we don't have insider knowledge of that, but like, just like you just did you see the video I sent in our like bros chat? You see him bouncing around on that leg. I think he, I think he's fine. I, I think he's ready to roll. Um, so th there, there's that. Uh, I guess sorry for our listeners, the Utah. Twitter put out them learning uh, the Tongan war dance, which I don't remember the name of. You'll forgive me. Um, but Cam Rising is in the front row bouncing around as they're practicing it. Like, um, it, it, he looked pretty comfortable on that knee is what I'm saying. And for the record, on the depth charts that got released today, Cam Rising he was, was first. QB1, so. He was first. And now that could be just like for the season. That, that one I'm not reading too far into, but, and, and, Coach Whittingham was like, I'm, I'm not going to comment on his injury or on uh, his availability or Brant Keithy's 
which to me is like, okay, he's playing a little bit of gamesmanship, and he did hide. Uh, he was he successfully hid an injury from Cam Rising last year when they played Washington State, I think. I can't remember. But, like, the broadcast crew was caught off guard. You know, they they, they didn't even know that there was going to be a change at QB. Um, so we'll see. Um, I, I honestly am, am not sure it makes a giant difference. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, like, Cam Rising is a really good player. Utah's going to want to run the football. Florida's going to want to run the football. This game is going to be a physical matchup, and it's how do you do in the trenches. Um, and, yeah, I think the offensive line of Utah is is going to be pretty good. They are starting a freshman left tackle, which is kind of surprising. Um, I mean, he's a, a, a heralded recruit, but as a true freshman, very first game, uh, we've seen that in the past. In fact, uh, as Florida State fans, we saw what Will Campbell was able to do last year or uh, what, what he wasn't able to do right out of the gates. Uh, more importantly, Jared versus wreaked havoc, uh, had a couple of sacks, um, a lot of pressures. He, he played pretty well against him. So uh, it's just a tough position to be put in as a, as a true freshman, but we'll see how, uh, uh, goodness, I'm going to get it wrong. Spencer Fano, not Logan. They're both on the team, but uh, brothers. Uh, we'll see how Spencer Fano performs there. I also expect Florida to be able to run the football in Utah. So I think this game will kind of go uh, in time-wise, not in terms of like the outcome, but time-wise, similar to the Notre Dame game and the Navy game where it just clock just keeps on running. And if you're not careful, you might blink and miss an entire quarter. Um, so <laughs> I, I do think this one's going to be a, a close game. Um We'll see. We'll we'll see what happens. That one, I, as far as predictions, I don't I don't know if you want to throw out a prediction or if you're. Um... Oh, so the line is sixteen six and a half favoring Utah. Hmm. Um, I think Florida's not. I Florida's used to SEC, you know, crowds. I don't think they expect what they're gonna get out here in Utah. Like, the the must is a pretty crazy environment. It'll be um, loud. Yeah. Yeah. So like. I, I do I, I would go under the six and a half. I, I, I would say, I'm picking Florida by three. Oh, so not only does Utah not cover the spread, Florida wins the game outright. Yeah, I'm afraid that might be like so. And if they do that, you know, Florida fans would be like loving it. I wouldn't. I don't want that to happen. So, but I think they've got that. that those running backs that can. They're just a different level of athlete sometimes. Yeah, than, I uh, I definitely said yeah a couple of year a couple of weeks back I should say on the pod like I don't know if there's a set of running backs outside of Gainesville that I take over them. I'm not sure at least, and you know Penn State's probably got something to say about that. Michigan maybe does too, but yeah, they're yeah. right up there. They're really really good. Um, it's just a matter of can so, that offensive line get the movement they need. And yeah, I I can okay. I kind of think they might. I just I question if they have to throw the football. I don't know if I trust Graham Mertz. You, you mentioned like, oh yeah, he might be more consistent than Anthony Richardson, whereas his highs won't be as high, but his lows may not be as low. Like I don't know. I've seen some pretty big lows from Graham Mertz in the past where okay, he was last, kind last of a similar the FPS system. Is not that low, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm just saying like you know he's kind of in a similar system where they're gonna run the ball out of power sets with two tight ends like. Does that sound like Wisconsin's offense from the last couple of years? Yeah. Throw off play action? Of course. Like, he was already in a system that supposedly plays to his strengths, and and, and was we've that? seen what that was. We've seen that what that was. What was that, Steve? It what was like, transferring out of Wisconsin, and yeah, not – I don't have stats right in front of me, but no, I, no, like, I, I, I don't, don't trust know. him to not throw the ball to the team, to the other team. Okay. Then that's what I'm like. If I, if you can ca- do enough to keep them honest and away from your def- away from stacking the box, that's where I think you got a chance. Like he doesn't have to be a phenomenal. He just has to be a game manager that doesn't mess it up. I did see a video that went out the other day, um, posted by some Florida State people. So of course this is going to put Florida in a bad light. But it like was showing Graham Mertz uh, mic'd up in practice, and he's like, he's he's not like a uber serious kind of guy. He seems to be messing around. And one of the comments that was made said, "This feels like very Willie Taggerish." <laughs> oh boy! Uh, which 
Might say I something. mean, you can see it that way. Maybe it's maybe it's confidence. Maybe he's just he's that loose and feeling that good. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Um, as What's far as think? choosing that game, uh, I oh gosh, I I feel like the the line is is too heavily skewed to Utah. So I I definitely like Florida to cover. Um, I think I I think I'm gonna give the edge to Utah to win the game. But if you're you know, if I was to choose it based on, on what handicappers have put, um, I would take Florida and the six and a half points that they're getting. For the record, we're t- both terrible betters, so don't listen to anything we say. Yeah, this is not gambling advice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Need that disclaimer. If anything, if you bet the opposite, if you do the George Costanza from Seinfeld and, and do the opposite, you're, you're probably going to be in good shape. But that's what I think for that one. Um, Corey, what, what, other, I, I, what other games you got your eye on this weekend? Um, the Miamis playing each other ah yes whoever we whoever loses we have to call either like coral gables university or the university of coral gables or oxford university in ohio there you go there's talk that tyler van dyke is hurt there's talk that at least from a floor state fans messing around like they're gonna roll him out again hurt like (laughs) you think they learned this idea and also you think he'd learn like i'm not gonna deal with the staff anymore either way i mean if if you roll him out hurt or not hurt and you go with the backup, I think you're in a better shape. You should win this game. What's the line on that? Do you know off the top of your head? 17. Yeah, and it's at Miami. It, it should not be close. At Miami of Florida. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. The real Miami. The real Miami, we all know. Did you, um, did you see Did you see Blaine, or, uh, Blaine Gabbert? No, yeah, uh, no, Blaine Gabbert. Gabbert. Yeah. Brett Gabbert, Blaine Gabbert's younger brother, who yeah, is the exactly. quarterback for Miami of Ohio, said, like, the, the real, real Miami. Miami's. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we'll have to see it. Now they did play Kentucky pretty tough last year. Now Kentucky, I I, I would venture a guess that twenty twenty three Miami is a much better team than twenty twenty two Kentucky. But um, I, I don't know. They they had they they made it interesting for a bit. So we'll see if they can be road warriors once again and uh and give the Hurricanes a game. Yeah, I'm gonna say this is one where the Hurricanes blow them out. All the all the Hurricane fans start patting themselves on the back, saying, "We're got it. We get ready to go." And then we'll run into Texas A&M. We'll see. How and then A&M will 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 either cement that or yeah. or, or give another. Uh, but I, give I, another I think perspective. Cover the spread seventeen. Miami covers. Yeah. Miami of Florida. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was, every time I say it, I'm like, I oh, we should probably be a little bit more. We're gonna have the same uh, issue on the next game that I'm gonna talk about the Carolinas. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> Oh boy! All right, we'll go. We'll go by nicknames: the the Tar Heels and the Gamecocks. There you go. Um, all right, I'll jump out on this one. Yeah, I, I told you I'm not super high on North Carolina. Um, I like them in this matchup, though. I like them in this matchup. Give me the heels. I think it's funny because I'm high on South Carolina and North Carolina, and higher than you are on both of those teams. So, I'm interested to see what North Carolina's offense looks like. That's the number one thing yes. I'm interested to see. Especially without Tez, Tez Walker, is that what his name is? Uh, the double transfer from uh, Kent State. And, you know, he transferred it during a COVID year and never played. The season got got uh, suspended or whatever. And he's still being held out by the NCAA. Yeah, this is the NCAA trying to be relevant still, which is ridiculous. Anyway, I'm excited to see the offense there, and I'm excited to see Beamer Ball played. And see if this defense, NC State, or sorry, North Carolina's defense is any better than last year. Um, I think, what's the line on that one? Do we have North Carolina minus two and a half? Is uh, hold on, they are favored. Let me find it. Sorry, I don't have it right in front of me. Um, yeah, yeah. Give me a second. Keep talking about it. Yeah, I mean, just like game day is supposed to go there, so I'm excited to see that one um, and see how it goes. You got it on ABC. Um, I'm pulling it up right now, the line. Oh, dang it. But honestly, Yeah, it is. Sorry, I'll, I'll jump in. UNC minus two and a half. I was right. So that's interesting. On a, because it's at UNC, correct? It is in Charlotte, I believe. Oh, it's, okay. So. Yeah, it's the Duke's Mayo Classic, which to me is annoying. Like, game day is going to a place that it's not actually a college campus. Yeah, it's going to be terrible. Kind of lame. Sure. Whatever, but keep going. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to pick North Carolina to cover on that. I think their defense is going to get better. We'll see. Um, having no change in D.C., it's similar to USC. Why do I think North Carolina is going to get better and USC is not? <laughs> that makes no sense. But we'll see how they get do. Um, they have some transfers in for sorry, their cornerbacks and stuff like that. And 
I, I'm really just excited to see how this teams do. I'm I'm bigger on their both quarterbacks, so I think both quarterbacks are going to have great years. So, yeah, should be should be a, a fun one. I I am big on one of those quarterbacks, like like we've talked about before. So that's why I'm I'm on the heels again. You mentioned some of the question marks that we have for North Carolina. Uh, I'll mention a couple question marks for South Carolina, like their offensive line. Can they block anyone? Um, if they can't block North Carolina, I'll wager a guess that their life gets a lot worse uh, when they reach conference play. Um, so that'll be a good measuring stick game for the the Gamecocks up front. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump to another one that I am interested to see. Um, we're going to go like back in time from Saturday to Friday. Uh, Louisville, Georgia Tech. Uh, again, uh, we've talked about how I'm big on, uh, gosh, not Louisville. Jeff Brom. I, I was going to say, I was thinking Brian Brom, and I was like, that's his brother. I, what's his name? Jeff Brom. I think that they've got a, an opportunity to potentially make some noise in year one. Um, well, they do but, have an opportunity. They have an easy schedule this year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they only open as a seven and a half point favorite over Georgia Tech, who was not particularly sharp last year and did. I mean, I guess they did have a little bit of a of extra juice to them once they made the switch from um, once they they relieved Jeff Collins of his duties um, and and then their new head coach, gosh, whose name is now escaping me. Um, the king of coaches can't remember the other coach, huh? I know it's embarrassing. Gosh, what's his <laughs> name? Uh, it is Frank Key. There it is. Um, oh, yeah, I right. looked it up. I had to look it up. I'm going to be honest. Where did he go? Um, is he? He was on the staff at okay. Georgia Tech. He he was the interim coach. Coached him, I think, to a four and three record as the interim, um, and yeah. was given the job. Something they beat, like that. They beat UNC last year. They lost to Miami. Beat Virginia Tech. Lost to Florida State. Lost to Georgia. So that's kind of yeah. like how they end the season. Yeah. Um, so that one to me is interesting. I, again, I I like some of those. I think I talked about this last year when we first started doing the pod, but those early games that are conference games where there's a little extra juice to them because it's like, hey, this is going to start setting out what, what the pecking order is, uh, particularly in, in, in conferences where there's divisions. Now the ACC for the first time ever does not have, well, I guess first time ever, but for the first time since they've had enough to do a championship game does not have divisions. Um, so it, it maybe isn't quite as um, high stakes if it was like a, a competition between two within the same division, because now it's just the two with the best records. Uh, but it'd just be interesting to see how quickly does the offense get rolling under Jeff Brom at, at Louisville. Uh, is Jack Plummer really what they hope he is in terms of a, a veteran transfer that has experience in that system from his time with Jeff Brom at Purdue? I'm excited to see it. Um, it's definitely one that will probably hold the attention as Miami, the Hurricanes, cover the spread over the over the Red Hawks, uh, which uh, I guess you predicted, and I'm I'm gonna join you on that one. I I didn't uh, didn't mention that earlier. That one's one that's interesting to me. I don't know if you had any comments on that game. Yeah, no, I'm interested in seeing Jeff Brom. I think internally I'm rooting against him because I'm not a Louisville fan. I'm not a Jeff Brom fan, but yeah. like I do think that they they have a great opportunity to make some good shockwaves the first year and if he does that he's capitalized on it with a great recruiting class it scares me a little bit they should handle business against georgia tech i mean he's at georgia tech but or but i mean whatever or is it at, even at georgia tech it's, the it's in atlanta yeah okay. it's at mercedes benz so it's, another it's not another... at georgia tech but it's like 15 minutes down the road <laughs> how many fans do you think they're getting there though I mean, Georgia Tech probably has like 45,000. Yeah. They probably have more for the MLS soccer games. Than the- <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I think, I think that, that if you're measuring the stadium, it's probably about 65, 35 in favor of Louisville fans. That are yeah, that's be probably there. about right. Um, awesome. Uh, Oddly enough, I, I, it's also the predictor of what FPI favors Louisville. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, 68, 32. <laughs> All right. Um, any other games you want to cover? There's maybe one or two others I might highlight. Um. I'm excited for two kind of out here in the West-ish area. Sure. Colorado versus Boise State. Or, sorry, Colorado versus TCU. And then uh, Boise State versus Washington. Um, Colorado game, I'm excited to see Prime and see how, what is this kind of experiment that where you flip an entire roster in, in, in a week. Um, how does that go? 
that you can basically say, hey, if you don't want to be here, get out, <laughs> or I'm going to recruit over you. Um, are they the real deal? Are they not the real deal? Should we expect three wins like Vegas does, or does the win t- total go up? Um, I've already made it known I'm, I'm not a huge believer in Dion's coaching ability. I think Dion can recruit the talent that he needs to get to be successful, but I'm interested to see if he's able to put the coaching decisions into his coordinator's hands and see how they do. Um, TCU, what are they? Are they the runner-ups from the national championship last year? Are they kind of back down to earth? Well, we think they will be a little bit, but not like still a good team. So um, honestly, I had TCU in that game. And then Boise State, Washington. Like, I'm excited to see our first visual of Washington. I'm sure Washington's favored in that game significantly, but that'll be exciting. So, yeah. Uh, first of all, let me jump back to the TCU Colorado game. Um, yeah, uh, Colorado. My concern is is along the lines of scrimmage. I don't know what they've got there. I don't think uh, they know what they've got there. They they've recruited a bunch of skill talent, but to me, it's like, man, if if Shadur Sanders has you know less than a second to get rid of the football, more often than not, can is that going to work? Uh, my bet is probably not. But uh, again, may, maybe they're better along the lines of scrimmage than I expect. Uh, for TCU, yeah, like. Um, uh, Uh, Like Jay-Z said in the famous collaboration with Linkin Park, can I get an encore? Do you want more? Um, And uh, yeah, what do they do for an encore? I I told you later earlier in this offseason, I I think people think that they're going to come crashing down to earth. I have a, I got something in me that says, oh, they're, they're probably still like an eight, maybe a nine win team. If things break their way, I like some of the pieces they brought in the transfer portal. Um, I, you know, Art Bryles can can coordinate an offense. You know, Sonny Dykes obviously is is going to help as well, and is is a brilliant offensive mind. Um, that one's fun just because again, you got a, a team that's looking to to make a, an awesome first year statement in Colorado, and one that just came off of an amazing first year statement in in the Horn Frogs. So um, that one's uh, a great way to kick off your Saturday. It's it's the the noon kick Eastern on Fox. Um, and yeah, I expect a ruckus environment. That's, it's funny. I think we talked about this at one point, but like having crowds there at the stadium somehow affects my experience as a viewer on television even. So, um, it's fun to see packed stadiums and everyone's pumped for the season to start. So that one will be one of those fun environments. Um, Steve, the line I'm, for TCU is 20 favoring TCU. Do you have over or under that? <sighs> I'm going to say under. I'm going to take the over. Yeah. I I just like I, I I like I feel pretty good about this TCU team. I just wonder if it takes them a couple weeks to really kind of get it things sorted. Yeah. Um and I'm I'm excited to see Shooter Sanders and see how he does. Yeah. I I I'm curious to see, you know, how how his game translates to the FBS level. Um because yeah, he had solid numbers but it was a different level of competition now he had the recruiting pedigree to play at this level like uh, so it'll be interesting to see what that jump is like for him and and many others that uh i guess not many others but but for the few jackson state transfers that followed dion from jackson state to colorado is the jump competition uh, a shock to the system or were they ready for this all along so we'll find out um with regard to the Boise State Washington one, I, I I don't know if I've I need to just check and see if Boise is officially announced a starting quarterback. They had a young gun that I really liked playing quarterback last year, whose name is now escaped. Taylor Green, there it is. Got it looked up, but I don't know if he's been named the starter or if they're. I know they had a couple of other uh, options that um they were potentially considering, but he's a dynamic athlete. Uh, and, and I think you're going to need one against particularly Was- Washington's defensive line is, I think, pretty, pretty strong, pretty, pretty solid unit. So uh, what can they do? And, and Andy Avalos is a good defensive mind. Uh, he's head coach at Boise, but was the defensive coordinator at Oregon for a while there. Uh, and it, what can he do to potentially slow down Michael Penix and that uh, really strong uh, receiving core Romeo Dunze and oh gosh names are escaping me now I'm not it's late um, I'm gonna use that as the excuse I, I have been up like 
a long time. I started working this morning at 5 a.m. coming off of vacation to try and get get rolling. Um, I don't remember the other. Uh, no, I can pretend like I know it off the top of my head either. So. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, and maybe we'll close the loop with our, our listeners in just a second on that. That's a fun one. I do expect Washington to win, and I, I will take them to cover. But, uh, again, just the, exciting to see uh, those matchups that don't happen that frequently. That one's interesting. I remember looking at that one. Um, for that, those two teams being so close to one another, they've only played like a handful of times. I don't have that right in front of me, but I remember being surprised that, um, you know, back in the days when – conferences and 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 college football play was a bit more regional that those two haven't crossed paths crossed yeah. paths more um oregon's played uh boise state a fair amount and i don't think they really want to play them anymore because they keep losing to them but uh we'll see what washington can do yeah the line on that's 14 14 and a half i think washington covers too all right all right we got a couple more big ones um yeah. sh- should we go to sunday or it was there another I yeah, let's go Saturday. Saturday. You want to cover? All right, uh, the big one we've all been waiting for: Oregon State, San Jose State. Exactly, uh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, we kind of talked about San Jose State being, uh, in some ways, impressive against USC. You know, they they, they look like they're you know uh, at least a team to be reckoned with in the Mountain West. Uh, Oregon State had a great year last year. Uh, the DJU era starts at Oregon State. Um, I'm I'm bummed to see it just because I again it, I'm I'm not shy about this. I like the Beavers. Uh, I like what Jonathan Smith's done there. I think they're kind of getting screwed in conference realignment. That, that part has me a little uh, miffed to to be polite about it. Uh, so I would love to see them have just a killer season this year, kind of like Brian and you mentioned on our on the last pod where I wasn't there. But um, excited to see that game. Uh, yeah, give me the Beavers to win it. I don't know if you had any comments. I was mostly joking when I brought that up. No, I actually had that on one of the ones I wanted to talk about because I want to see, like, this is going to give us an idea of, like, who USC really is a little bit because we've seen San Jose State play. Now they've got a little bit of time, and we'll see them go against Oregon State. How much trouble did they cause Oregon State? I think Oregon State wins this one 41-14. Um, like, I think it's not close. I think DJU is confident. He feels like he has a team that's confident in himself. And then he has a running team and a line to – support him i think it's going to be this is going to be a team that's going to roll Mine's yeah six and a half. yeah they're they they're really they're really talented on yeah some of those units on that team again their their offensive line uh damian martinez is a sophomore running back man that guy was fun to watch as a freshman so expect big things out of him I don't think DJU will be asked to do too much. Um, I, I think that Jonathan Smith will be able to put him in a position to be successful. So, yeah, like you said, it gives us a really fun data point to compare how those two teams matched up with San Jose State. Um, so uh, that one's fun. Um, I think now let's 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 talk about the real one <laughs> uh, in Orlando, LSU, FSU. One of the most fun games of last year, and it happened to be early in the season, which is a little disappointing, just because like oh. I don't, that one's going to be hard to top, and it turns out it was. Like, um, again, Florida State last year won by a blocked PAT. Uh, I, I, LSU scored on the last play of the game, and and uh, the blocked PAT prevented it from going to overtime. Let me tell you the story about how that happened and how that went down in my house. Um, I don't think I shared this on the pod last year. Maybe I did. I don't but know. Brian and I were watching together. I think you were in Texas, right? You were visiting yeah. our parents. Yeah, it was yeah, yeah. So Brian and I were watching together, and as LSU's driving, I think they're probably crossed the 50, but maybe just across the 50. Um, someone knocked on our door. Um, Go away! And, <laughs> well, so I like I, I knew who it was. I knew who they're were, they were coming. They're like, hey, we want to you know, some some friends from our neighborhood. It's just like, hey, we want to drop by some cookies. I was like, okay. And I even told him, I was like, look, I, I, I will take the cookies. I, I cannot sit and chat. I, I, the, the, the excuse I gave him was, I have family over. And then at the door, I was like, look, he's over here. This is my brother. The reason he's over here is because we're watching a dogfight of a game. And Florida State had a chance to go up by 14 with about a minute left and turn the ball over. And now LSU's driving and potentially could tie the game or win the game. Uh, and so he's like, oh, well, totally, yeah. I'll get out of your hair. Um, 
you know, I don't know if he's a huge football guy, but like, you know, I was like, oh, thanks. You know, appreciate the gesture. Thanks. Thanks for being a good neighbor. Um, and then, so I like, I paused the game, right. For a, just a minute. I think this is while they're sorting out was, was Mason Taylor down or not down. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Where it took forever. So like we had to like skip through a bunch of that where we were a little bit behind. Um, and then we catch up and we get the blocked PAT. And immediately this, this friend of mine texts me. He's like, dude, no way. Like, <laughs> he was like so pumped for you. Uh, <laughs> It was just like, yeah, it was kind of just a funny experience where it's like, I, I'm on pins and needles. I'm trying to be polite and, and be like, thank you for this gesture. Um, and then he was like totally cool about it. He's like, oh, no, I get it. So, um, But heading into this year, uh, I'll, I'll give you my take on the game, right? Uh-huh. Um, I, I, like I, I've said this probably five times this offseason because I'm just so ready for football and been starving for it. But both teams, I think, got better throughout the year. Uh, I'm on record saying I think LSU, the rate at which they improved was maybe a little bit higher than Florida State. There's some transfers in. There's some questions. So for me, this game boils down to a couple of things. Um, I need to know how the LSU secondary is going to play. If they're disjointed there, I think Mike Norvell and Alex Atkins will scheme up some things that will, you know, just like last year where they ran the, the, what, the flea flicker reverse. A flea flicker reverse or something like that to to Travis to to get a deep pass. Um, again, not a great pass. It was a little bit behind, a little um, yeah, pass a little late getting the, out. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but schemed someone open there. Uh, a couple of other times where they were able to find things deep. Um, but the person, the the wide receiver that caught both of those deep touchdown passes, Pokey Wilson, not on the roster anymore. Now you might have two better ones, like. <laughs> um, so if LSU's cobbled together secondary from the transfer portal is not, you know, operating at peak efficiency on week one, it could be a long day for, for Tigers fans, uh, at least for, on the defensive side. Now the flip side of the coin is, man, I, I think their offense can be pretty potent, and I think it got better as the year went on. I think Brian Kelly learned how to call the offense in a way that really maximizes Jaden Daniels' potential. Um and and they've got some dangerous wide receivers, but they also have some that I, I think some people are higher on than I am. Uh, Kyron Lacey, I've seen some of the highlights out of camp, and he does some pretty impressive things. But I also have seen him drop a lot of football. So, um, but, you know, that I, I, I think I need to see some consistency from their number two wide receiver in order to be, like, really terrified as a Florida State fan. Um, but... It's, I mean, I think this one comes down to the wire. I think whoever loses it is definitely not out of any of their goals. <laughs> uh, I think you lose this game, that, that's an excusable loss. And um, so I, you know, LSU is favored by two and a half, I think was the last number I saw. Yeah, I will no, I take one, one. LSU to cover by the slimmest of margins. Like, I I think that number is really good. Like, it's going to be, I think, a very close game, and it could be the last person with the ball ends up winning. Or the last person that doesn't have a PAT blocked ends up winning. (laughs) I, so, I look at both teams, I disagree with, I I think a lot of people have talking heads have said that LSU got better as year went on. I feel like LSU got better until the end of the season, and they kind of fell off a little bit. Like, you struggled with Arkansas, you lost to A&M, like, and you did okay. Like you did, you won your bowl game, but it was like you didn't play anybody in, in particularly difficult. Um, I yeah, Purdue that. had half a roster. Yeah, exactly. Um, here I'm pulling up the line real quick for LSU. That being said, like Florida State, they lost a safety, of some of their defensive tackles, a defensive end, and two wide receivers from the team. Uh, and, and running back. But they got better at running back. They potentially got better at wide receiver. I'm not going to sit there and say they got better at safety because I don't think that's the truth. Um, I think they're going to be a little weaker at safety. And then defensive end, I am not. I don't know if I think Patrick Payton's better than McClendon, to be honest. Like, he's probably a better pass rusher, but not maybe a better player overall. Um, LSU, I, 
they had some transfers come in on the defensive side of the ball where I think they'll be better, but that's where I think that they'll be better. I don't think they're going to be overly better in, in, on offense, to be honest. Um, I'm not, I'm not a huge Brian Kelly believer. I think there's, and like just thinking about back to last year, like their LSU had some blown plays. I mean, two missed fumbles, Florida State could not capitalize on either one of them. Or I'm sorry, missed a uh, fumble. Yeah, punts. Yeah, yeah, fumbled punts. Punts. And then Florida State fumbles the, the ball at the one yard line. If they had punched that in, it's a 14 point game. Like, and even like, I don't know. I just think LSU, LSU isn't going to beat Florida State. I think Florida State beats them. And I hate to sound homerish, and I hate that if if LSU wins, not only am I going to be wrong, I'm going to be sad about it too. Um, <laughs> but I think Florida State has the power here to beat the team, beat them. And I think, I mean, this is Brian Kelly and Mike Norvell for the fourth time in the last five years, I think. Yes. Yeah, it's like, and I think Brian Kelly is. One and two now, or two and two one. And one. Two and yeah. one. So, but all games have been close. I mean, Notre Dame, Florida State went to overtime two years ago. LSU went extra point in this last year, and then the first game was Notre Dame. Um, I don't think it was that close, to be honest, on that one. But I don't believe so. Yeah, it was. That was it, a yeah. Memphis squad too. So, um, we'll see how it goes. I I'm thinking Florida State, and I think Florida State could have a breakout thing, saying, "Hey, we're here." Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's the thing is I do think this is a close game, but I, I, I can see a world where Florida State wins by two scores. I can also see a world where LSU wins by two scores. Yeah, I, it's I feel just like, of, like this could be all over the place. Uh, you're absolutely right about the defensive side of the ball for LSU. Uh, if you remember, Harold Perkins hardly played in that yeah, first game. He's going to get better. Uh, and he's a wrecking ball. Like, yeah. that guy is, is a star. And they got the perfect compliment to him, in my opinion, Omar Spates uh, from Oregon State, who I, I've got a serious man crush on. That guy, I love the way he plays football. Um, always in the right place. Very good and stout against the run. Um maybe is a little bit limited in pass coverage, but you know, I think with the right defensive coordinator, you're not going to ask him to do too much of that. Um, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see what happens here. You know, uh, Mike if Norvell I'm... has had to kind of, Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just going to say Mark Norvell has had to kind of cobble together an offensive scheme for a few years now. I feel like this last year was the first time it's like, okay, we have some legitimate pieces to work with. Uh, and now I think the weapons are even better. So they they they'll they'll get some points. They will score some points. And the question then becomes, what does LSU do offensively? Um, and can they not? Can they avoid the special teams blunders that doomed them in the first matchup? You mentioned the two muff punts. We mentioned the block PAT. They also had a blocked field goal. Like yeah, special teams was the difference in that game. Yeah, I I look at the matchups in my head and I can think of. Like off their offensive line versus LSU's offensive line versus Florida State's defensive line, I probably call that a wash. Maybe give it the nod a little bit to Florida, Florida State defensive line. I look at the wide receivers from LSU and the Florida State wide receiver or DBs. I probably give the, the nod to the Florida State DBs. I think they're good, pretty darn good, and I think this LSU receiver core is not not bad. But you got to look at what Florida State's been going on going against in practice. They've been going against six five six you know seven wide receivers that are supposed to be depending on who you ask you know all team all acc or all american wide receivers you look at running running back their running back versus our linebackers probably give it to a little bit they're running to their running back and then you got the x factor of their quarterback um how how do you count him or him i we all know he's probably going to be spied by fsu linebacker i'd probably give him i could probably give the nod to Jaden daniels on that but i don't first he, the loach yeah, Kalen Deloach. Yeah. I give him the nod to to Jaden Daniels though on, on on that one. And then, but you go to, on the reverse side, Florida State's receivers versus their defensive backs. I go Florida State's receivers. You go their linebackers versus our running backs. I probably go their linebackers. Defensive line versus offensive line. I call that a wash. Now, if Mason Smith was playing, I would give it probably to them. So, and then you go special teams. I'm terrified about Florida State special teams. So. <laughs> Honestly, this could go anyway. It's gonna be a rocky Man, game to watch. It's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be a, a game that, uh, you know, it, again, I, it won't be boring. It'll probably be stressful for 
those that have a dog in a fight. And if if you don't, it'll be you know just must see television because it's two pretty talented teams uh, trying to to set their season off on the right course in week one. Um, I don't know if you had anything else, or it maybe we jump to the Monday game. Let's jump to the Monday game and call it. All right, uh, we we talked about this uh, a while back. I'm excited for this game. I don't know if there's been as much excitement heading into a Duke season in since like what maybe the 2014 team after the 2013 was pretty pretty salty. Um, maybe then, uh, but they they've got themselves a quarterback. They've got themselves a coach is what they really do. Mike Elko, uh, man can coach ball. Uh, I I think that they've got. Uh, I think their team returns a lot of production from last year. Um, I, I did hear on, I think it was, oh goodness, it was Bud Elliott. I don't know if it was on the cover three or the null cast. It might have been the null cast, but apparently their leading wide receiver from last year is out for the season this year with an injury. So um, that's a bummer for Duke on that one. But hosting the Clemson Tigers in week one, standalone game, Labor Day night, uh, Wallace Wade Stadium packed to the gills with a full 37,000 people. Um, I don't know if that's the actual capacity. It's probably something in that neighborhood. Uh, but I do expect it to be a pretty wild environment for Duke, so relative to who, what it can be. Um, and, yeah, who knows what happens with the, the you know, offensive coordinator change at Clemson um, and, and, and whether Cade Klubnick has made some strides, again, showed some flashes of promise in uh, year one. Uh, but also struggled in the bowl game against Tennessee. Um, and so new coordinator, new look. Uh, how does that help him be successful? Does Clemson's defense continue to kind of carry that team as it has over the last couple of years to 10-plus to wins? Um, that's, a, that's a fun one to, to watch and an opportunity, again, for, for Duke to make a name for themselves or for Clemson to kind of reassert themselves as the, uh, as the dominant power in the ACC early on in the season. Yeah, so the thing I'm most excited about is watching Clemson. Oh, by the way, Wallace Wade, Wallace Wade Stadium, 40,004. So you're close. Oh, my bad. My bad. <laughs> didn't mean to short you those, those 3,004 that I didn't um, say. No, but I'm excited to watch uh, – oh, wow, Riley. What's his first name? Leonard. Leonard. Riley Leonard. No, no. It's no. Riley Leonard. I'm talking about the OC from, from... – Oh, Garrett Riley. Excuse Garrett me. Riley. Thank you. Riley Leonard's a QB at, at I, Duke. Duke, yeah. I'm right. like – I'm excited to see Garrett Riley and, and his work at the offensive coordinator's position. I think this is a turnaround. There's, it's interesting to watch Dabo because since Dabo came into Clemson, they weren't that great. They were okay. And he made the changes that were necessary to make them successful. Now he does get hard headed. When you get successful, you sometimes you think you have the right, you know, the right way to win. You win two national championships or whatever else, you know, the right way to win. And so he thought he could hire from inside. I think he understood, oh, that hiring was a bad call. I'm going to go get out and get the hottest name on the market, Garrett Riley, and put him in as an OC. And I think that this is the right call, like, to make this team well. I think there's another one where he's like, I'm not going to take any transfers. That's the other place where he's kind of gone a little hard-headed. I'm, if they don't beat Florida State this year and if they don't do win the ACC, which I'm not sure I believe that they – I think they I believe that they will win that still. But if they don't, I think that's one of the adjustments he goes – Hmm, Florida State just beat me with how many transfers? I think I should go get some transfers. Um, but this this team is going to be good. I I, I full whole faith in, in get what Garrett Riley brings and watching what the, he did at TCU, and I'm excited to see that. We'll see what Duke is. I don't expect Duke to put up much of a fight. I think the line is 14. 12 and a half. 12 and a half? Yeah, I'm taking the over for Clemson. I think they win by 21, maybe 24. Oh, according to ESPN right now, it's it's thirteen. So yeah, but yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see uh, what Garrett Riley can do with, you know, again with a, a young quarterback. Uh, I, I'll I'll be excited to see how he utilizes Will Shipley, who I think is one of the more, like he's just not talked about as like not a enough. top weapon. Uh, and I think it's just because he's so reliable and so dependable that it's just like, yeah, of course we expect him to to get his numbers and to move the chains and to, um, you know, to to light up the scoreboard. So I don't know if he gets his due, like like you just said, not not enough. Um, 
So that's a, a fun piece for him uh, as a, as an offense coordinator to work with. Well, um, I think the talent you don't have to lay, re- rely on Kate Kublik if you don't want to, if you don't need to. You know, like, yeah. there's no reason to because you've got the offensive line and you got the running back. Put yourself in a position to be successful, and I think Garrett Riley's a good enough play caller to do that. Now there'd be other play callers, namely the head coach of Texas, that I wouldn't trust doing that. You know, <laughs> uh, you got Pete yeah. Hunter and he still passes the ball seventy times. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that that one will be fun again. Mostly just I think a test uh, on an early season test on the road. What I expect to be a pretty, um, pretty raucous environment again, relative to what it typically is. I think is an important caveat to put on Duke. Um, Prove me wrong. Show me the Cameron crazies don't just show up for basketball. Um, but I, I think that one's going to be a, a fun game and, and a good one to watch while I dread the start of another work week. Uh, yeah. At least you got one day off, though, right? That's right. That's right. Um, I don't know if you had anything else. Um, parting shots. Yeah. I don't you have, have any really parting have any shots. I feel like I got mine in throughout the episode. I kind of just just sort of shotgun approached it through through the episode. I just remember last year we thought week one was going to be a dud. It ended up being really, really exciting and really fun. I'm hoping for another one this week with lots of stuff to talk about and just just embrace five days of football. It's going to be amazing. That's right. Soak it in, everyone. It's going to be great. Um, yeah, if you're this deep into the pod, we appreciate the, the listener uh, or the support from the listeners. Um, like the video if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the pod or subscribe to the channel. Um, and feel free to give us a follow on socials. I don't know if if y'all saw it, but the drawings are back. Corey's bringing the fire. Um, appreciate it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. We actually, even if you're following us on TikTok, which I don't know if we've even mentioned on here that we have a TikTok, but we do at cfp.paint. Um, we did a fun little recap of all the all the drawings from last year. Yeah. uh earlier this yeah ch- go check it out it's pretty cool um but yeah there's there's more to come from that more to come on our socials appreciate the support looking forward to another awesome season of college football we'll see you next time on cfb paint